what I'd like to share with you is some, some experience and insight that I've had in um, what was definitely a poisoned chalice event where I won a large European funding to look into uh, interdisciplinary practices uh, in research, mainly in the European context. And that was a journey of four years, which led me to learn that there is a world out there that has learned many lessons time and time again, and seems to still have to learn at least how to apply them. This is specifically in terms of interdisciplinary practices. Now we were focusing on research, but we soon ended up into the debate that is at the heart of this beautiful conference, which is the future of, as we called it, universities or higher education. And why? Because if our starting question was extremely focused and narrow, it was about how do we get funding bodies for research at higher education level to promote, which meant that we thought that was where the problem lied. We, of course, soon turn the uh, focus back on ourselves within academia and ask again, why is it that if we all seem to agree, and you can imagine the amount of general statements of support, enthusiastic support, I would say, by our universities around the world and the foundations for research, that there is such great support for interdisciplinary inquiry, and then it doesn't really work like that. It doesn't quite happen. And, um, and the answers came, and none of them are surprising, <clears throat> but they are important to this session, I guess. Um, the answers came that the, those obstacles that have been known remain somewhat uh, underlying our efforts, our best efforts uh, to push forward and push beyond, within, and through all these boundaries that we call the disciplinary boundaries. Um, I've, I've worked with all these colleagues and they came from 32 different countries and uh, included some of the wonderful members of the World Academy as well. And some of the things that we've come up with are perhaps important just as, it, as aspirational points here for us today. The first is that we felt that much can be achieved if every single individual member of the academic family uh, could make a little bit of a greater effort to be open in terms of the values that are being held, of the values that are at stake in every discipline that is taught, and uncover and unveil and confront the intrinsic um, ethical inquiries that all our disciplines require but are often untold. And one of the elephants in the room for me has always been and continues to be that incredibly powerful disciplinary area, which is economics. And despite the extraordinary implications of the last financial crisis, it seems that we still resist. We still resist. And it is, as the philosophers of science told me during this journey that I mentioned um, on interdisciplinarity, they said, well, it is known as one of the most impermeable disciplines um, to other uh, inquiries and other perspectives. Um, we also discussed many things that would go under the, camp, the chapter of transformational learning and education and research and understanding. And we discussed a divide between our minds and our bodies and the institutionalization of that divide in our academic circles and how, ma how much it matters, especially today when, as was discussed even in the last session, what do we do with this beautiful, powerful instrument that we're all using today? The digitalization, does it matter that we maintain physical contact? What are we losing? What are we gaining? We discussed things like the need to embrace imagination, the arts, the humanities in ways that are not being 
enabled today. And we did that because we felt that more should be said about the role of higher education institutions in terms of shape, helping us shape the future. I heard some beautiful things on this and I won't dwell more on them. I'd just like to emphasize that so much more needs to be done to open the space within academia for the broad conversation about the future as well as the past and the present. And this means a leap of faith and a change of epistemology as many of us know when it comes to futures and it's considered you know, optional entity and, and dimension. I think I'll leave it here and I'd love to pass on to Alberto to hear some of his thoughts. I know that um, I think that I've, I could have maybe touched one last thing, which is fear. I was very in, um, <laughs> encouraged to hear some of the session in the previous sessions, um, Mantella talking from the Club of Rome, talking about fear, because that was another thing that came up in our inquiry a lot. The untold and deep fear that is uh, across the corridors of, I should almost say, power within academic circles. Uh, the individual fear of not being good enough, of not keeping up with the immense amount of knowledge that is constantly churning, being churned out every single day. The fear of losing your job if you dare to confront a discipline and embrace interdisciplinarity. I can talk a lot about that and so on and so forth. So I leave it at that because it's a very human uh, emotion. And Alberto, I will leave you the floor, please, to take it from here and bring us into a more hopeful <laughs> space. Thank I'm you, sure. Olivia. Thank you. And first of all, on behalf uh, of the World Academy of Art and Science, thank you, really thank you to everybody that accepted the our invitation to contribute to this session. Uh, some of us, <laughs> Ralph, for example, we've been uh, for many years uh, saying things uh, that now come uh, on the foreground uh, because the world uh, is in much worse shape. Like uh, for many years, uh, we've been uh, uh, talking about uh, <laughs> climate change, now everybody talks about climate change because it's a phenomenon that uh, even the negationist cannot uh, ignore anymore. So things are getting worse. And uh, paradoxically, like uh, in many other cases, when uh, uh, things uh, are getting worse, uh, it's uh, less possible to negate them, to distort them. And uh, in my opinion, uh, and in my experience, uh, more and more uh, people that have, they are decision makers uh, in academia now are really part, uh, wanting to be part of the solution. I was very impressed uh, by Peter and other colleagues uh, from uh, the Arizona University just uh, <laughs> in uh, Geneva, we had a, a wonderful uh, conference uh, on the leadership. Uh, I mean, there is a growing awareness that time is running out uh, and that we need uh, change. So, what kind of change, uh, in my opinion? I think uh, that uh, paradoxically, in the field of education, uh, uh, is uh, to combat the uh, ignorance uh, that education has shown uh, in blatant ways. Uh, it's been often the case. University, instead of temple of knowledge, uh, been uh, often a uh, temple of stopping change uh, and uh, stopping awareness. Uh, you know, now I think uh, nobody can uh, really ignore that education. Uh, is a, a basic and important aspect of the social construction of reality. And so nowadays we are dramatically aware of the failings. And now we have to learn from the mistake of the past. I think it would be not useful, nobody to blame, but not useful to negate 
the enormous problem that we have created by giving false knowledge and continuing to give mechanicistic reductionistic tool to read reality, then we know since 80 years ago that we live in a relational universe. So a new pedagogy, absolutely. Although we shouldn't forget that the systemic holistic pedagogy were proposed also in the past and they didn't have the space because they are pedagogy that not only are systemic but are participatory they are student-centered even better they are people-centered and we have tons of research that they gave better results better learning better behavior school more critical thinking we have a, you know, research including millions of people, and we show that uh, this kind of, for example, person-centered, but uh, we could talk of many other pedagogy, like uh, Montessori, Pestalozzi, so many. Uh, uh, so we know the issue here is to be aware that uh, what has been stopping those uh, new pedagogy is that uh, they are more participatory, more democratic, so they include sharing power, and usually people that have power do not want to share. Like nowadays, we see people that have a vaccine do not want to share it with the country that are too poor to have access to vaccination. And that is clear, that is crazy. But it's happening right now. It's always, uh, can we learn from our mistake, that is the sign of wisdom. So a new pedagogy would be not only to have knowledge, but to become more wise and to learn what fundamentally interdisciplinarity and intersectoriality, in my opinion, are not enough. That could be done mechanistically too. We have to learn in school, but also in society, in the family, to relate to ourselves and the different parts of ourselves on sustainable ways, which means with respect and acceptance. We need to learn to live respecting other people with different color, different sexual orientation, religious and political orientation. We have to learn to make peace with ourselves, but also with every, every living organism on Earth. Because we've been destroying the planet and been at war with life because we think we can make a profit destroying forest and making extinct fish and whatever. Because we, we, have, we are smart and we want to gain and get rich. Let's stop being crazy. Let's help people to learn to live in a sustainable way and being part of the universe instead of feeling alien that they come here to uh, like pirate to get the treasure that is, uh, you know, something precious. We are so precious that we are able to destroy our planet. Very good. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, yes, I will, um, as, as it was in, in announced that we would roughly follow the, the, the line of uh, presentations in the, in, the, in the program, let me then invite Peter Schlosser, who is Vice President and Vice Provost of Arizona State University, uh, to give us a first, as, well, now a third, I guess, intervention since Alberto and I took our own space. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. And, um, you know, take your time. We probably can afford to have 10 minutes each if that's a, it's, it's a good average. Um, and I'll flash you at 10 minutes if necessary. Thank you. Over to you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Uh, thank you, Alberto. So as Olivia already mentioned, 
a lot has been said, and I unfortunately could not listen to all the content that has been related due to other meetings, but I, 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 I caught some of it. So let me, let me just start by setting the context in which we are moving. And that, as Alberto already pointed out, is a world that is at a critical crossroads. In a way, we are conducting a big experiment to figure out what the plasticity of our planet is to take all the pressure we are putting upon it. And it, we, we, there's no doubt we have pushed our planet into its buffer zone. It's almost like driving a car on red without knowing how big the reserve tank is. Now, if you would be in that situation, you really would, would be quite anxious to figure out where the next gas station is. So we have to figure out how to get out of that situation where we see pressures mounting, not just from climate, but also in terms of water availability, safe water, enough water, food security, public health. We saw that the planet actually is conducting experiment with us now, feeling under pressure and say, let's see if they still can react to a pandemic. So COVID is actually as tough as it is for us, could have been much worse. And that came a bit as a shock, although we should have expected it, rather than a slowly building pressure such as that that comes from climate. So what does all that mean? We have to figure out where we are, humankind as a part of the planet. A lot of the pressures we are seeing on the life supporting system is induced by our species. But we are also the only species on the planet who can take that pressure off. And we have to accept that responsibility as a society, as a whole. Now within society, academia is not free floating as sometimes we like to believe. We actually have a mandate from society to provide the knowledge that le leads a safe path into the future for all, for global society and all its uh, sub subparts. So are we measuring up to that? We actually are producing knowledge at a mind boggling pace, but we are not producing it in the way that is needed at that point in time. And what is needed at that point in time is to add to the highly successful quote unquote reductionist or disciplinary knowledge gathering, a more system-based holistic view of the world and diagnosing what the issues are and then coming up with options for solutions that can address some of the problems. And in addition, why that would be a race that we never can win if we are just in a reactionary mode, we also have to be more foresightful, future thinking, some people say, you know, future forecasting, threat casting, there are many, expressions out there, but what in essence it means is be more anticipatory while we are solving some of the problems we have created in the past to make sure that we are not just falling into that same trap over and over, because then we will be in a rat race that we cannot win. Now, what does that mean for academia and how we should think of ourselves in my view? And that is what we have set up here at Arizona State University. We if we are thinking about what we are faced with, of course, we have a mandate to discover because we want to see how the world looks, where are we coming from, where are we going, what is our situation right now. We also have to make sure that we can transmit that knowledge into what I call the learning space so that we actually can train students with profiles that are adjusted to what the big challenges are they face when they leave academia so they actually can make an impact. We have to be much more solutions oriented. And that does not mean that this is a second class of science. I think there's a, there's a spectrum between basic research and applied research and the solutions actually come from the entire spectrum. But we have to look for how can we extract it and transmit it into the outside world. And that is a fourth space that we are 
that we have built here, which I call the engagement space. We have to be much more linked to the outside world in terms of seeing what the problems really are, how are they struggling with, and what can we do to infuse the knowledge in a way that it can be taken up in packages that can be tested, that can be actually implemented, and that we can see if that works. The fifth part, of course, is we have to network. We have to think differently. We cannot be focused on small groups, on individuals in academia as we did in the past. In fact, we have to network among institutions as a whole in order to make that work. Now, what do we have to change? We're just going back now to the learning space. There are a lot of disciplinary successes, but we, we, as I mentioned before, we have to change that by a holistic system thinking, complexity think, thinking. We, we really have to understand that a, a fundamental precondition to be able to provide good insight that can be implemented is to understand the complexity of systems, the planet being the ultimate complex system we are dealing with. So understanding of complexity from intuitive to quantitative has to be part of our education, actually, in, I would say from pre-K to graduate uh, education. There has to be more solution thinking in the sense that we have to provide decision support for decision makers in many parts of the stakeholder community. We have to learn how to relate incomplete knowledge. We are trained to just release our knowledge when we are 99.9% .9 sure. That takes too long. The problems are outpacing us. So we have to understand how or learn and then to, to apply how to relate partial knowledge with the appropriate caveats. But that is still better than letting decision makers make their decisions without any knowledge that we are still holding because we want to prove it. So this is a fine line to walk, but I think we have to learn how to deal with that. What does it need? It needs new disciplines, new structures. We, we need new ways of building schools that are dedicated to that. Here we build an entire college that's uh, dedicated to that. We have to tailor programs, create new programs that are much more uh, dedicated to, to the, the bigger cause. More practice oriented was already mentioned. Um, more engagement with the outside world was mentioned. Digitizing so that we reach more. So we, have a, we are approaching 150,000 students at ASU. We soon will be at the crossover point where we have as many people who are on campus as we have people who are getting their degree via digital platforms. So we have to develop these digital platforms and tailor them that they actually fulfill our purpose. Um, we have to fuse disciplines. We have to, already has been mentioned, we have to integrate arts and sciences, humanities with social sciences and natural sciences, medical sciences, engineering sciences. That is part of not just inter, but transdisciplinarity that we need to address these problems. We have to, in essence, also learn a new language. We are often talking about sustainability, sustainable development. I changed the language that we are using to global futures, which includes sustainability, but it also is actually nudging us much more to thinking ahead and thinking forward. We also, in terms of how we function, we are lacking the forms. I mean, I think a lot of people actually want to go into uh, this solution space, but don't know how to do it because they're in a comfort zone. So we have to help them. We also have to create recognition systems so that they feel they are actually you know, doing work that can be evaluated the same way. And I will uh, close uh, with that final point. We are actually way too senior oriented. We have to listen to the voice of the younger people, the youth movements, our students. Our students are actually a driving force on us that we often neglect. And without doing that, we always will be behind the curve. So these are some, maybe some random thoughts, but I, I hope they come across as somewhat connected. And with that, uh, I would like to, to uh, conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Peter. That was indeed, I would say, quite aligned with parts and pieces of conversations that have been held over the afternoon. So 
um, but the way you've connected them, given that it is the experience of your own uh, your own institution, of course, is different and uh, encouraging, I would say. But we'll get back to that. And I'd like to um, give the floor to Ralph. You're on the line next. Uh, so um, Ralph Wolf, founder and president of the Quality Assurance Commons and fellow of the World Academy of Art and Sciences. So I'll give you the floor. And again, if you can use up to maximum 10 minutes, that would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have some other remarks, but there is a topic that has not been raised that I think is absolutely critical. And it is the politicization and the intentional mis- and, and disinformation of knowledge that is affecting the capacity of all education systems. Um, I will say just to cite a survey two or three, uh, three years ago, um, over 75%, excuse me, um, over 55% of one of the parties in the US, the Republican party felt that higher education was moving in the wrong direction. Conversely, 55% of Democrats felt that higher education was useful for the future. But that has led to defunding. It has led to uh, misrepresentation we have seen with COVID. Survey came out this morning in the news that um, over 50%, well over 50% of one member of members of one political party actively believe one or more pieces of false information about COVID and 10% believe multiple pieces of myths. The media is misrepresenting, dis disinforming uh, for political gain and purpose. And we are now seeing with respect to critical race theory, legislatures actually banning the instruction of certain types of curricula. So I wanna say what wasn't what I was going to speak about, which I'll turn to, but I have to say that we must deal with the capacity to educate in the face of a media barrage, which undermines all of what we are trying to accomplish. Conversely, there is also, uh, lack of integrity with a lot of research when it gets established that it was not replicable, can, can be replicated on the one hand, uh, or whether the data was falsified. And we need to take responsibility for improving the quality and the integrity of the research. But we definitely need a strong media campaign to restore in this the value and the focus of education in an environment in which uh, it is challenged dramatically. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to talk a bit about pedagogy and to the extent that we wanna talk about sustainability, I'd like to draw on my experience as the head of one of the regional accrediting commissions in the US and my current work uh, in founding the Quality Assurance Commons. Uh, in dealing with, uh, in, at WASC, when I was the president, diversity, embedding diversity, the concept of uh, uh, the multiple dimensions of diversity, not only access, but curriculum, student support, and outcomes. And uh, more recently, with the Quality Assurance Commons, with employability skills. And I'd like to take what I, we've been learning and working with two statewide systems of higher education with uh, more than 40 programs, multiple faculty, what we've learned and try to translate that to educating about sustainability. Uh, we have worked within institutions and one of the things that I would have to say is that we all know that institutions are so siloed, not only disciplines, but schools within academic schools and colleges, business versus uh, social sciences, hard sciences and the like. But then you have career services, student support, alumni and the like. And uh, what we have learned is that kind of siloing destroys the capacity for success of students, particularly the new student 
who is first generation, comes from underserved populations. So first lesson we've learned, and we talked about employability skills, which are really lifelong skills, collaboration, communication, leadership, growth mindset, problem solving, what employers, but really everyone says is needed, and a sense of community. What we've learned is that a single course doesn't do it. A single course on race, a single course on career preparation or a workshop, one workshop at the career center. What we learned is it needs to be embedded in the curriculum and staircased uh, right from initial to uh, the graduate right. level. So I'm gonna say one, we have found that uh, embedding in the curriculum is critically important. And I would say true is sustainability. We can't just have a course on global climate change, but we have to show the different dimensions in the same way of writings and composition and critical thinking about not just in a science course or a gym. We also need to link to careers. What are the careers that are available in this field from each of the disciplines, whether it's English, humanities, sociology, psychology, how do we deal with the impact? and bring career awareness in. There also needs to be a relationship to employers. Will employers hire people who have sensitivity to this issue? And we need to work with employers to make the capacity to problem solve around sustainability to be a relevant hiring characteristic and to demonstrate to employers the value added of people with that perspective. Fourth, we need to consult with alumni who are working in this field. What preparation was most helpful to them? How did it support them? Fifth, we need to look at actual outcomes. What in the big issue in the US is salaries. Did people earn salaries that pay for their college tuition? But equally and more important, I would say, who got, who completed, did underserved students complete at the same rate across the field? Who got good jobs? There are data from Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce that shows very significant disparities between different groups, men, women, uh, African-Americans, Latinos, uh, the same issue in the context of the US. Six, professional development. We have found faculty who said, my job is to train the next generation of faculty. That is not the job of today's faculty, particularly at the undergraduate level. The job is to serve the needs of the future for the new population of the future. And only a small percentage will ever be faculty. I will conclude by just saying that what is really needed is to a framework that brings these units, these silos together, this mindset together, that includes professional development, changing the framework and the attitude of the faculty. It means also getting and putting in the hands of faculty and decision makers, outcomes data, and seeing and making part of the curriculum throughout the curriculum, embedding about the future, including sustainability, migration, all of these issues that are going to affect them in their lifetimes, uh, some of which Peter mentioned, water, all of these are part of what they're going to need to deal with. And they are not to be isolated in a single discipline, but I would submit need to be part of the holistic educational curriculum and we need faculty to be trained, not only to embrace it, but to know how to teach it. The same way we have learned, you just can't teach race and diversity without training and understanding, and what are the right materials? How does it apply? And with data about the success of this, I think we can make transformative change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. That uh, almost tied back into the beginning with Peter, who started off reminding us what was the mission of universities. <laughs> so now I would really like to give the word to Carol Spalding, President Rowan Kaburos.
Community College in the USA, and I'm sorry because I'm sure I pronounce that really badly, but uh, Carol, over to you and uh, uh, please take your 10 minutes and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes to compare notes, which would be lovely. Thank you. So I'm president of a large community college of 22,000 near Charlotte, North Carolina in the USA. And our primary delivery is online education, not because we meant to do it, but because that's where the students want it to go. Um, and we, our largest program is college transfer. Our primary mission is workforce development. And we offer basic skills to adults, apprenticeship, vocational programs, public services, the gamut. And so we are highly uh, flexible. We call ourselves nimble. Um, and so we, we think we've been doing a really great job of uh, managing the future with our students. However, what we're finding is that um, we do need to have more transdisciplinary perspectives, customized and personalized curricula and contextualized knowledge um, and relevant and effective. So for the complex world, but we've got a new problem that I've never seen. And I've been in this business now through uh, a career in Florida and now a career in North Carolina. There's always been a gender gap in higher education participation between the sexes. In 1972, the US government passed laws to promote gender equity in education because there was a 12% gap between men and women's achievement for a bachelor's degree. That gap closed by 1982 and the trend lines for men fell and women's increased. Prior to 1979, more men enrolled in higher education than women. To address the problem of access, there were federal grants to U.S. community college, colleges to help displaced homemakers, mostly women, prepare for entering college. The curriculum was transdisciplinary, customized, personalized, and life-changing in its effectiveness. I mentored my college Women's Center grant for 25 years with great success. Over the past decade, I've grown, grown more concerned about the downward trend of men's participation in higher education in North Carolina and the U.S not just from an equity viewpoint, but from the likelihood that this trend is and will impact the rising income equality, the future of marriage and families. Our graduates experience transformation as they become sustainable wage earners and successful in their careers. These students impact their own families and increase the prosperity of the region by millions of dollars in additional wages every year. The success is not limited to either gender, but the decrease in the enrollment race is driven by the absence of men. I'm certainly not alone in my question of where are the men? The, the New York Times special section on predicting the next 20 years also addressed the college going rates of men saying that it is stalled for reasons that mystify experts. Author Justin Wolfer submitted that the rising gap in higher education may turn out to be one of the most transformative trends of our time. Men's lack of participation in higher education is an historical anomaly. The trend has always been that each cohort achieves more than the generation before. What is puzzling is that this disinvestment by men is happening when the career and financial benefits of having a college degree have grown dramatically and the financial support to attend college has also grown. College graduates earn approximately a million dollars more over a lifetime than a high school graduate. We also know that most well-paying jobs and careers in the 21st century require post-secondary education. This trend is not unique to the US. Women 25 to 34 years old from all 38 members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development are more likely to have a tertiary degree than men. The OECD reports that this data is astonishing. People can't believe it. Hannah Rosen, author of The End of Men, reports it is the strangest and most profound change of the century, even more so because it is unfolding in a similar way pretty much all over the world. The pandemic has affected both sexes enrollment at college, but more men than women have opted to stay out of college. We do not know why. We know that education does not simply expand your horizons and help you develop your potential to be wiser. It makes you healthier and wealthier. It makes us better parents, citizens, and community leaders. We already see the future in our daughters and granddaughters. They are choosing to pursue their careers first, marry later, if at all, and have children later, if they choose to have any. 
Our society is already being changed for the better by improved educational attainment by women. As girls, they do better in schools than boys. Young women are predominant valedictorians of their high school graduating classes. In countries around the world that suppress education for girls, we see women actively fighting for the privilege to go to school. Meanwhile, the developed nations in the world are seeing a growing number of men not graduate from high school, not enroll in college, and if they do, not finish in numbers that are astounding. Just as we address the gap in college enrollment in the 70s for women, we need to address the lack of participation of men in this decade. The experts are mystified and surprised. What programs do we need? Perhaps something similar to the 70s approach that addressed transdisciplinary issues, customized and personalized curricula and contextualized knowledge and becoming more relevant and effective in our com increasingly com complex world. Should we create special programs similar to the displaced homemaker programs personalized to men? What do we need to do to attract and retain men in higher education? We need to address the male college crisis sooner than later. So um, this is not a problem I expected to find or, and as I was doing research about what I was gonna talk about, I thought this is maybe the most urgent issue I have as a community college leader, as an educational leader in North Carolina and the US. And now I see it by doing the research that is happening around the world. Our, we have more men living at home with their parents than are in the workforce. So uh, this is a change. The, the, uh, and I think it possibly could go back to one of the uh, panelists from a prior panel where we talked about fear. And these guys not doing well in grade school, not graduating from high school, are left to their own devices of uh, gaming and other kinds of things. So um, changing up how we do uh, college, I think we've got to change up and bring back uh, the men that we so much need in our society. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Carol. And uh, thanks for solving uh, the, the technological challenge. I'm glad we could, uh, we could get your contribution as well. Uh, you've opened up a completely different perspective on a similar on our question, which I think was uh, very interesting. I, I'm just going to open up the floor now to anybody who would like to intervene, and uh, I think I'll leave it for the moment and he, listen to either Ralph or Peter or Alberto if you want to, since you're all the three of you are men. But what, what I was struck by is Carol's statement. We need a solution, but we don't know why we've got this problem, which which begs, which opens up quite a challenge. But we can comment on this or on any of the other issues. And just as a reminder, Peter, you were saying also um, that in summary, having listened to, to all this, uh, you were reflecting on the fact that indeed you went up and went out and changed things within your institution. Um, and that you reminded us of the need to listen to the younger, to basically those who come into our halls or digitally for our Zoom channels, uh, which we're not doing enough, which is extraordinary to be honest, but it is very true and um, that should make us reflect. If I may say, uh, I was uh, uh, very interested by what uh, Carol said, uh, and also the others, uh, but uh, in uh, Europe, uh, a quarter of a century ago, the European country decided to invest in what they call the Bologna process uh, to become uh, a knowledge society. The Bologna process uh, published, uh, and is available for free to anybody interested, a bulletin, and it makes evaluation. One of the recent uh, uh, bulletin uh, uh, said, we are not reaching our goal and the most uh, lacking uh, uh, variable that uh, we fail to apply are that uh, we do not involve sufficiently students uh, in uh, curriculum development uh, and also on evaluation. And by the way, uh, there was a six 
books that, that they suggested, and two were of Carl Rogers, long ago published, and a lot of research of what works. We know what works, as I was saying also before. We have a research, for example, in the States involving millions of students, what does work and what does not work. One thing that doesn't work, in my opinion, but the, you know, reading the research, is teacher training. Teacher trainings damage teachers and is really not the solution to train teachers. We can do better than that. We can train people to become facilitator of learning. We have tons of research, even helping doctors to study medicine, you know, if a student centric, it gives a better result. What is tantamount to have these successes is to share the power. I think there is a serious issue that, you know, teachers, professor, administrator are afraid to share the power they have and empower which make make people more responsible. The last thing I want to say, from my own experience as a student, when I was a student, I was uh, at times bored silly by a teacher that uh, didn't have any enthusiasm, they didn't like to teach. And I was uh, fascinated and excited by teachers that love teaching even more they love learning. I hmm. learn from those people much more than people that knew, you know, all the texts. So I think we know a lot. Do we have the willingness to really make a sort of revolution, risking what our chair in the status quo? I think the things are so going so badly that we might need that like it or dislike it. <laughs> Thanks, Alberto. You just briefly, you made me think that actually two years ago when we got into this COVID uh, um, tunnel, we, at least in, in this part of the world, and I heard a lot of colleagues also in the UK and the Netherlands, were thrown into this with zero advice on, as to how you go from walking into the classroom to logging on and getting onto Zoom and you just get on with your job, no teaching, no advice. I mean, it was extraordinary. So, but that may be just terrible experience uh, in, a, in a land of excellent experience, I don't know, but it just makes me think the teaching, the, the effort that our institutions, the investment, the time and the resources, where are they? I mean, that's another thing we are not talking about, but resources, you know, the financial crisis here cut the resources, the public funding to universities drastically never got back to the same level. You know, this makes a difference. We're going to digital because it costs less. Is this what we're doing? Does it matter that you teach us how to get male and female students excited? I don't know. Sorry, these are more questions and answers, but <laughs> over to my much more experienced colleagues, Ralph, Peter, and Carol. Yeah. What, one quick thought on what, what Carol said, which, which is, of course, a trend that we are all following and that mm -hmm. we are puzzled about. Sometimes I'm wondering if it is excess. There was also something in the chat that said that, you know, women actually had less opportunity and worked therefore harder valued it more to get this education because it is one way to become more independent and to have more opportunities yeah. so i think the the access question is one thing the, the other very quickly is that there seemed to be evidence that the kind of um, studies that we need these days interdisciplinary transdisciplinary that women are doing better in that um, I'm not sure if the numbers are detailed enough to say if some of the growth is along these lines or if it is just across the board. But, but th there are some trends that we are filtering out of, of data that might help us diagnose where it's coming from and then de design solutions to get back into balance. Yeah. So I, I think would, uh, the idea... 
of preparation, teacher preparation is, is a good one or facilitator training is a good one. Um, and certainly online education has, we do 30 hours of training at least a year and we have a requirement to uh, go through a teacher training um, curriculum before you can teach online. So we were ready for it and we were able to uh, get our students through uh, their curriculum in, in pretty good order. So I'm pleased that we were a little bit ahead of the game, um, but now that we think we've got we've got more choices for students, they can go back and take a face-to-face -face class. They're not doing it. They're taking an online class because it's uh, satisfactory to them and it, it meets their needs as well. Um, and that, so I just wanted to, to mention something else. We're working really hard with our K through 12 system. And the biggest issue that they have is that they have so many vacancies now for teachers and our teachers edu teacher education programs are uh, have been shrinking and shrinking and now um, we are seeing the uh, uh, the results of it and it's not good um, so I think for the the disinvestment uh, financially has also been in the K through 12 system at least in the states um, where a lot of that money has gone to charter schools and other things uh, and just general um, um, issues that, you know, we can go into if we need to. Yeah, um, yeah. But the the teacher education piece is who wants to be a teacher? Why would you want to be a teacher now? Yeah. Um, I remember when I first got into it, teachers were held in esteem. I don't think that's true now. How do we rebuild the institution um, of, of higher education and K through 12, the whole system uh, needs attention um, and TLC, because they've pretty much been beaten up this last year and a half over COVID. Um, what do we do at this point uh, to keep our, keep our teachers? Just like, you know, what the hospital's doing to keep their nurses. Now, one of yeah. the overlaps there is that <laughs> teachers are, nurses are leaving the hospitals and coming to us to teach. Now, there, there's a, the only positive thing I can say about COVID at the moment. And Roz, you were going to say something, I think. Uh, I was going to say that um, the challenge is one that starts in high school. It's not just that we're finding it in college, but we're also seeing it in high school. We're mm -hmm. also seeing who's going into science and STEM. Uh, we're seeing real challenges. We, uh, I think the future uh, bodes badly in the sense of Will people support education if they don't value it for themselves and for their own children? And so uh, it's uh, a challenge as we're in a period of COVID has really impacted budget issues. And so I think it becomes then uh, the political issues. Where do these men go? If they're not going into the military and then perhaps getting military benefits afterwards. Are they staying out of the job market? In the U.S., there are, so, there are more jobs open now than there were before COVID. And yet, and unemployment was very high. People were not getting jobs. So we have a, a double whammy, if you will. We have more jobs. We don't have people filling them. We have many women who've left the workforce for home care because there's no child support system in the U.S. of any mag of any support real okay. significance, and so uh, we're really facing an issue of creating a future that's inspiring to people rather than just something to get through. And we had that's where I think the transformation of the system is really going to be powerful and needed. That. Uh, and I know that there are state leaders who are really working hard. I particularly work in, uh, in Kentucky uh, with the head of the state higher education system there, mindful of this process. And people are now talking of affirmative action for men and uh, what are the ways in sports and other things rather than intellectual pursuits have been ways. But I think it's also getting people to be aware of science and what the science, I mean, if we're going to convince people that global climate change is in fact real and we need to do something about it and we need to address sustainability, people are going to be, have to be open to the IPCC report rather than the political attacks on it. Uh, they're going to have to be able to make judgments, critical thinking and the like. 
and an uneducated population makes that all the more challenging. And mm -hmm. notwithstanding all the great efforts that particularly community colleges do, and Peter, I will say ASU stands as I think a remarkable example as one who's followed it, um, you know, as uh, it's grown and developed and uh, seen it uh, do so much transdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. uh, but it stands out as rather a unique uh, it's it's not been yeah. replicated, if you will, as much as Michael Crow tries. It's not a model that has been replicated to the same extent. And that's what we really need is to see more of these successful models replicated that um, demonstrate success. I, I do share that uh, somewhat uh, less uh, optimistic uh, reflection, Ralph, at least uh, I remember in our famous adventure on interdisciplinarity, we did spot Arizona immediately as one of the, you know, shining stars, but, um, but there are not that many. Um, Peter, you made me think that of these 83 plus uh, researchers that joined us for four years reflecting on interdisciplinarity, the very significant presence of women did strike me. I mean, it's not a statistically relevant universe probably, but, um, um, the only book we published out of it, five editors and we're all women, just because, <laughs> so there is uh, perhaps something there that links also with Carol's question and, uh, and Peter's point at the, at the very beginning of the politicization and disinformation uh, trends and, you know, is this touching men more than women? I have no idea, but uh, does this have something to do with them? Then, you know, why should I even engage with academia that speaks of things I don't actually believe? And, uh, <clears throat> but- This is um, a global, I, it's, it's, to my knowledge, it's a global issue working in other countries that uh, particularly in the Middle East where there are so many youth, the population is substantially below 25 that, um, the universities that I've worked there have the same issue, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and the like where I've worked, uh, the universities are predominantly women. And so mm -hmm. it, um, and because they can join the military, police force and the like, and they're, but um, we cannot fill the technology job. Everyone is needed <laughs> is really the issue for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think, Alberto, of uh, one of your many um, fields of, of interest and, uh, and experience in terms of, you know, in some, this was mentioned in other sessions today, um, the, the rather simple, but by no means easy issue of, is our, how much is our role, um, the one of allowing ourselves, enabling ourselves to know who we are, how we function, what matters. And so rather than so much debate about content, which is still so, um, so drastically driving, at least the conversation of the institutions I've been looking into, um, thinking of content from the other perspective, meaning it is us and who we are first and foremost that we need to understand how we function, and then how we relate, for example, to the, that politicization, that disinformation, what happens, yeah? How do we learn? How does our brain work, our emotions? We need to follow also what we learn through research. Student center is already better than traditional education, but there is much better approach than being student center, is to be people-centered. In the university, I restructured that not only students are put in the center, but uh, if they're private, uh, the owners, uh, the directors, uh, the employees, uh, and the professor. If uh, everybody wins, uh, then uh, there is uh, a chance uh, that we have the solution. The solution, in my opinion, are not uh, so far away. We need the, the willingness and the courage and the political will to share responsibility, share power, and have a, an education that is uh, everybody's a person, everybody 
deserve mm -hmm. respect. Uh, everybody needs uh, had to be taken in account, uh, and not only human needs, uh, also the needs of the plants, of the animal. This is a game uh, where we all win uh, or we all lose. I'm pretty sure about that, uh, and you don't mm -hmm. even need uh, a PhD or being a university professor to know. It's just uh, crazy not to know and not to act on it. I actually know all the great work that ASU is doing. I know a lot of the work that they're doing in North Carolina, I worked at a community college, and I'm going to encapsulate it by my Saturday morning meeting with a gentleman who was coming to help our local teacher. And it's all about inclusive education. And inclusive education uh, helps us understand that we're here to teach people where they are and where they're going. Uh, we're going to be a much more diverse population in the United States. It's one of the benefits I have of teaching where I, uh, working where I work, um, and very much more global. And I think people tomorrow are going to have to have that perspective, uh, whether problem solving and the way they do business. It, you just have to think in a global perspective. And COVID kind of showed it just for supply chain for a thousand different ways that we need to be thinking in a much more global way. And it has to be inclusive, as Carol said. So why are the guys not going to this college? Uh, what are the issues? And then how do you solve that? So I think it's going to be an exciting time if we make an exciting time. Otherwise, it could be a real hassle. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to the glass half full. I think there's a lot of things we can get out of the growing diversity of our population here in the United States, and I think globally. Thank you. So that is a very nice way of wrapping up quite an impossible conversation because so much has been said this afternoon and it's it's preposterous but it, you make me think of one thing that I that is hopeful is that there everything can get, seems to have the potential to go very right or very wrong basically at this stage where somehow what I've heard over the ver various sessions including this one is you know we can be we can push ourselves into a lot of optimism because so many good things and trends, uh, minor or major, are there. But we are also aware that there are some much darker things happening in parallel. So we are at a strange time, maybe like always in human history. And um, let's do our best to share the best possible yeah, knowledge and solution, which is what this beautiful platform is doing. So I'm sorry for the delay. And I really thank you all, um, including Sue for having made it. And uh, yeah, and I hope to see you in the next few days. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, thank you.